So today uh, we'll be talking about uh, psychiatric emergencies. So uh, my name is Dr. Suchendra. I'm working as a senior resident currently in Nimhans. Uh, MD PGH Chandigarh se kiya tha. So thoda bo to Hindi aati hai. Agar aapko kuch sawal puchna ho ya kuch uh, queries hai, aap uh, puch sakte hain. And uh, uh, maine suna hai ki uh, bahut sare uh, sessions ho chuke hain training uh, for Punjab doctors. Mainly on opioids yesterday and mood disorders ke upar, psychiatric disorders ke upar bahut sare sessions ho chuke hain. Mm-hmm. हेलो हाँ सो आज हम आज हम सकेट्रिक इमरजेंसीज के बारे में बात करेंगे सो so, अगर आप में से कोई फ्री है तो यू कैन स्विच ऑन योर वीडियो और कुछ सेशन स्टार्ट करने से पहले ही आपको कुछ पूछना हो या कुछ स्पेसिफिक टॉपिक पे फोकस करना है तो आप बता सकते हैं मैं ज्यादा टाइम उस पर दे सकता हूँ सो so, अगर किसी को कुछ बताना है या कुछ पूछना है ठीक है सो फाइन सो आई स्टार्ट माय स्लाइड्स देन बीच में भी अगर कुछ रोक के पूछना है यू कैन आस्क एनी क्वेश्चंस एंड इफ यू वांट वंस द सेशन इज ओवर इफ यू वांट टू टॉक अबाउट और डिस्कस अबाउट एनी स्पेसिफिक टॉपिक रिलेटेड टू साइकैट्रिक इमरजेंसी दैट आल्सो कैन बी डन सो आई शेयर माय स्क्रीन जस्ट गिव मी अ सेकंड स्क्रीन देख सकते हैं आप एनीवन यस यस इट इज विजुअल या थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम डॉक्टर अमनप्रीत सो फर्स्ट व्हाट डू यू थिंक इज अ साइकैट्रिक इमरजेंसी सो एनीथिंग एनी कंडीशन दैट रिक्वायर्स इमीडिएट हेल्प इन साइकैट्री इट कैन बी अग्रेशन इट कैन बी सुसाइड इट कैन बी डेलीरियम इट कुड बी एनीथिंग सो एनीथिंग व्हिच रिक्वायर्स एनी कंडीशन और अ सिचुएशन व्हिच वारंट्स इमीडिएट हेल्प uh for the patient and also for the relatives who bring uh, who bring the patient so that is called a psychiatric emergency going by the definition it says that a psychiatric emergency is defined as an unforeseen combination of circumstances which calls for an immediate action so ye jo alteration hai it can be in behaviors or emotions or thought process behaviors uh, it means that patient is very depressed psychomotor retardation hai or he is very agitated and restless so that could be the alterations in behaviors uh, bringing on to emotion it could be acute mania it could be severe depression and the thought process where patients will be having severe uh, persecution auditory hallucinations all the severe forms we call it as a psychiatric emergency so first we'll be dealing about violence and aggression so this is a, one of the most common thing we see in psychiatric emergencies uh, to start with we have in nimhans we have a psychiatric hospital it's a complete psychiatric hospital mm-hmm. where we have a, a dedicated psychiatric uh, casualty so uh, usually every day we see around 40 to 50 patients who come with aggression so this is one of the main symptom it is not a diagnosis per se uh, ye symptom किसी uh, किसी भी डायग्नोसिस पे हो सकती है इट कुड बी इन मेनिया इट कुड बी इन साइकोसिस इट कुड बी इन सब्सटेंस यूज एंड इट कुड बी इन सम फॉर्म्स ऑफ डिप्रेशन आल्सो सो ए वायलेंस एंड अग्रेशन व्हेन यू सी अ पेशेंट व्हाट इज द फर्स्ट थिंग यू शुड रिमेंबर इज क्या ए वायलेंट व्हाट आर द रिस्क फैक्टर्स फॉर वायलेंस ओके टू स्टार्ट विद यंग मेल सॉरी so in male uh there are, there are uh, uh, yes age age is a significant risk factor for violence who are young and who are strong who are well built is a main risk factor for violence and aggression and past history of violence ho sakta hai then substance history patients who are uh, taking opioids taking alcohol uh which means that uh, there is some uh, some aggression related to craving or personality related also personalities may uh, we can talk about anti social behavior or for example paranoia also where a patient is uh, having severe paranoid uh, pers- paranoid delusions or persecution towards some person who can be very aggressive also at times and commanding hallucinations by commanding hall- hallucinations what i mean is uh people will be hearing voices uh commanding them to hit someone 
to destroy some property so which we commonly see in psychiatric uh, psychiatry so these are the main common patient related risk factors which we uh, see in violent patient and environmental factors also could be a reason for example uh, we have uh, we don't if we have uh, not enough uh, staff okay so there are 20 30 patients and there is only one staff who can't manage so that could be one reason and inexperienced staff when a patient is getting aggressive you should know how to deal with the patient uh, if you start arguing with the patient automatically it can lead to more aggression and easy accessibility to weapons we weapons in the sense uh, it could be uh, tables chairs bed railings uh, iv stands scalpel blades so all these things could be uh, aggravating some of the violence in the patients so overcrowding by overcrowding what i mean is uh, a patient who is in severe paranoia or in mania if there are a lot of people around him that automatically uh, agitates him and makes him more restless and more violent so moving from patient factors and environmental factors so what do you think who will be at the more risk when a patient is aggressive so we all know that family members will be the first uh, uh, target for the violent patients okay the, the research also says that uh, uh, when a patient gets aggressive the first ones who will get uh, hit by or attacked by the patient as family members then is the staff harm to self could be one reason harm to property could be the other reason and the other uh, in patients the patients who are in the next bed so they are also at risk of getting uh, hit by the patient who is very aggressive so how to uh, deal with them so first uh, what you have to find is you have to remember that aggression and violence this is a symptom which can be present in any kind of diagnosis so first we have to uh, find out what is the reason for the violence or aggression of the patient so what we usually see is um, hospital may uh, when patient gets aggressive it, it could be many reasons so koi bol raha mujhe cigarette peena hai hospital mein bandh ke rakhe hain mujhe bahar jana hai so craving is one one of the reasons kisi ko mujhe hospital mein admit nahi kar hona chahiye zabardasti leke aaye mujhe discharge chahiye so that could be one reason somebody is not liking food somebody is not liking the bed or he wants to change the bed so there could be multiple reasons so first you find out the reason what is the reason for the violence okay and then you have to also find out what is the magnitude of the harm intended whether it is just a verbal abuse or he's uh, telling uh, threatening for a physical abuse also that you have to find out so what does a threatener want like we discussed what does he want why is he getting aggressive whether it is related to discharge whether it is related to change of bed whether it is related to his uh, psychopathology like underlying uh, psychosis or commanding hallucinations which are making him more aggressive so that reason you have to find out so does he have a plan that is the next step so most of most of the patients what they say is mar dunga aisa karke bolenge but what is his plan does he have any plan so if if there is a plan uh, what is the weapon he is going to choose and uh, how avail available is the weapon and how accessible for the potential harm so all these things you have to find out in a violent patient so by saying this you might be thinking a uh, like violent patient uh, patient aggressive hai, how can we have a conversation with a patient so it is always uh, uh, people advise to not to have a conversation when a when a person is violent but it is not uh, true in all uh, always so in psychiatry what we always believe is if you sit and talk to the patient if you have a if you start a conversation with the patient it establishes a rapport so once you establish a rapport automatically patient will start listening to you so always try to have a conversation with the patient rather than just assuming that patient is violent and i can't talk to them so always at least initiate to have a conversation at least try to have a conversation with the patient that is what we would suggest so while you are having a conversation the first thing you should remember is uh, you should provide him some privacy by that i don't, I don't uh, tell that you have to uh, take the patient in a room and sit and talk to him providing privacy is you can take to the cor uh, patient to the corner in the ward and there you can talk to the patient uh but not in isolation that is the first line it says provide privacy so that the patient can uh, open up and he can tell why is he getting aggressive what is the reason behind it if it is something like command hallucinations uh, or uh, severe paranoia few patients will be having a uh, you know paranoia towards doctors treating team or the other in patients or uh, uh, the colleagues around him friends around him so he'll open up and he'll tell us what is the reason so uh but remember not in isolation because that could be risky if a patient turns out to be very aggressive then it will be very difficult to control him so not in isolation but 
provide him some privacy so that he can open up. Then uh, what steps can we take? Patient should never be left alone out of sight. Always eyeball to eyeball contact should be maintained either by the family members or by the others. And uh, while you are having a conversation, keep the door open. Door is clearly open. Wana chahiye ki hum baat karte hain. Hero na hero nahi bande. Patient is getting very aggressive. Uh, you should not be heroic. You should not show his your heroism, so that uh, you have space to move, and you can leave the room if, you, if the patient is not manageable and not controllable. Okay, and maintain safe distance. Safe distance means how much can you sit? How much can you sit? How much can you sit? So it is advisable always to keep more than one arm distance. Okay, more than one arm distance is con is considered as a safe distance. So that that should be maintained always. And uh, if you are in doubt that you can't control the patient, the patient is very aggressive. So uh, if the patient is very aggressive, then keep a security or somebody along with you. Maybe your colleague, maybe your uh, 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 staff uh, from nursing staff. or a security guard who can protect you and always find out like i said reasons for violence what is the reason for violence whether it is uh, command hallucinations or persecution or something related to general ward admission so you have to find out all those reasons then what is the approach uh, what we can do so before uh, first we always think about if a patient is aggressive we'll sedate him we'll give injections or we'll restrain him physically so that is what we always assume uh, but before that try to have a conversation uh, with a uh, with a individual and try to yeah try to have a conversation with the individual and uh, try to calm him down so we call it as de escalation verbal de escalation that is the procedure we have to follow so this is one of uh, this is the mnemonic what we use safest approach so s stands for spacing like we discussed more than one arm distance should be maintained and appearance how should you appear you should always appear calm composed and cool so just give an empathetic professional uh, uh, detachment and you should always stay calm and composed try to build a rapport with the patient that is very important and focus so always uh, keep a focus on patient's hands patient's body language and is there any uh, chance of potential weapons around and uh, watch for any escalating agitation so that should be maintained and exchange exchange uh, by exchange i mean to say have a conversation so try to de escalate the patient who is aggressive or irritable so try to de escalate the patient try to have a conversation try to find out the reasons and by that we can have a conversation we can establish a rapport and uh, we can calm him down and then comes a stabilization process where the verbal de escalation has failed where we have failed to verbally de escalate the patient patient is getting more and more aggressive so that is where we uh, talk about physical and chemical restraints by physical restraints i mean that patient uh, is uh, tied up and by chemical restraints i mean chemical sedation we use multiple uh, uh, medications which i'll be discussing in the next slide what can be used and how much doses can be used to chemically sedate a patient and finally the treatment option so find out the reason whether it is depression or psychosis or it is mania or something related to the substance and we have to treat the cause so this is the safest approach what uh, we usually advise when you are treating a violent patient so these are the drugs that can be used haloperidol lorazepam phenergan olanzapine and zucloxanthine these are available in multiple combinations most of the all of them can be given intramuscular and whereas haloperidol and lorazepam are preferably given intravenous so it can be used in multiple combinations um, if a 60 uh, uh, if a patient uh, 30 year old adult uh, is having a severe aggression comes to you and you have to sedate him the first combination what we usually use is haloperidol uh, and first drug what we use is haloperidol and if you have to use in combination so haloperidol and lorazepam can be used haloperidol is used in doses of 5 mg and 10 mg and lorazepam can be used in doses of 2 mg and 4 mg so uh, the usual norm is to calm the patient down not to knock out uh, unless the patient is not getting uh, uh, calmed uh, he's not calmed down so in those situations we use multiple sedations okay preferably we use a haloperidol and lorazepam combination which is 5 plus 4 combination we use and we can give it intravenous so this combination can be uh, given multiple times but always remember that you have to monitor for the side effects and you have to monitor the vitals repeatedly so lorazepam as a benzodiazepine can uh, uh, 
can be a respiratory depressant. So that is one side effect. And haloperidol being an antipsychotic, it can cause severe EPS and the neuroleptic uh, malignant syndromes also. So uh, acute dystonia. So all these are uh, possible side effects of haloperidol and other uh, uh, antipsychotics like valanzip and zucloxanthine also. So usually what we prefer is haloperidol and lorazepam combination. And in a patient where EP, uh, who is more prone to EPS or side effects, we preferably use haloperidol and phenargan combinations. So phenargan in the doses of 25 or 50 mg can be used and usually it is given intramuscular. And uh, olanzapine 10 mg uh, is available as intramuscular in a, uh, which can be used in an agitated patient and similarly zucloxanthine is also available. So any doubts regarding this uh, dosages or uh, uh, other medications or how to manage a violent patient, always remember that violence can be present in any uh, psychiatric uh, diagnosis. Okay, so this is the usual way if you are uh, preferable, if you are, if we have to restrain the patient, but always remember, uh, physical restraint is always a last sort. So the uh, mental health guidelines, which was released in 2017 in India, also says that physical restraint should always be used as a last, last resort. So you can't uh, directly restrain a patient. First, you have to uh, try to verbally de-escalate a patient. If that is not possible, then try to chemically sedate a patient. If that is also not possible, then only you should consider physical restraints. So you, what in India we usually do is a four-point restraint where one arm is tied upwards and one arm is downwards and both legs are tied. So that is the four-point restraint we use with head and upwards. Uh, at least 30 degrees we should be maintained. When a patient is restrained, you should be careful of, uh, monitoring his vitals, whether his uh, respiration is uh, proper or not. And there are chances of aspiration also. So, and physical injuries, of course. So all these things you have to take, uh, take it into account. Uh, while uh, we see in the Western countries, they use a five point restrainer where the abdominal restraint also comes. But in India, we preferably use four point restraint given the resources we have. And uh, there are uh, people who only restrain uh, hands, only restrain legs or one side of the body, so which is not advised. So when we have to restrain a patient, it is always advisable to do a four-point restraint. Okay. So uh, what do we do after restraint? So we have to monitor the vitals and uh, his uh, respiratory rate. And every 15 minutes, there should be vitals monitoring, at least for half an hour to one hour. And remember, this, uh, this restraint should always be, uh, should immediately be removed once the patient is drowsy or once the patient is sedated. So it should not be kept all day. So always keep monitoring the patient every 15 minutes and mostly the patient will be uh, calming down within half an hour after sedation and after uh, physical restraints and uh, once we give uh, chemical sedation. So it is always advisable to remove. And uh, inform, the, uh, there are multiple instances which have happened that once the patient is restrained, family members start feeding him, they'll give him water, which will cause uh, aspiration. And there are other instances where uh, uh, the you, know, you call security, you restrain the patient and you leave. And as soon as you leave, uh, family members would have uh, removed the restraints and he'll get more aggressive and he can he can hit any one of us and he can damage the property also. There are multiple instances which have happened. So always advise family members uh, to keep a watch on the patient and not to remove restraints without uh, informing the nursing staff or the doctors. So moving uh, from moving on from violence and aggression, now we'll be discussing about uh, suicide. Uh, regarding suicide, uh, uh, like uh, these are the risk factors. So elderly are most prone for suicides. Uh, usually people who are elderly, like more than 50 years and 60 years and adolescent age groups these days, uh, there are multiple self-harms reported in the adolescent age group. Uh, compared to the Western literature, uh, Indian literature profile says that the adolescent group, which is between 15 to 34, has higher suicidal rate when compared to the Western literature. So this is one of the new findings which have uh, which has come in the suicide uh, uh, research, which says that elderly and adolescents, uh, along with ad elderly, adolescents are also more prone to suicides. Then past history of mental illness, a patient is having depression, uh, symptoms like uh, uh, hopefulness, worthlessness, feelings of worthlessness, hope, hopelessness, all these things uh, can aggravate a suicide in a patient. And similarly, mm -hmm. in psychosis, when a patient is having command hallucinations, where the voices are commanding him to commit suicide. So all this uh, presence of mental illness is itself a risk factor for, uh, for attempting suicide. And the other risk factors are past history of suicide, family history, and substance use especially. 
we see most of the patients uh, who attempt suicide uh, are under the effect of uh, either substances like alcohol or opioids or other substances for that matter what happens is in suicide what happens um, the patient the individual is always ambivalent uh, suicide thoughts um, we believe that suicide thoughts are uh, always come like uh, comes like waves so it peaks at sometimes and automatically it goes down sometimes so when the, these thoughts are at, are at peak and the uh, individual is under the substance of uh, uh, under the effect of alcohol automatically what happens is his control he loses controlling power so this this disinhibition will uh, aggravate the risk of uh, suicide in that individual so substance use is a is one of the main uh, risk factors of uh, suicide and poor family support and impulsivity where the person uh, takes sudden decisions it's part of his personality can also be a risk factor for suicide then how to assess suicidal risk so it is uh, always uh, in difficulty uh, when it comes to assessing suicide risk so many of us uh, will be having an initial thought that should we ask questions about suicide what will happen if we ask a person who is already having suicidal thoughts will be will we be provocating uh, his suicidal thoughts or for a person who is in severe depression if we uh, if we question him about suicide are we uh, putting thoughts into his mind about suicide so do we have uh, any participants having similar questions do we have any doubts like that should we ask a patient by asking a patient are we provocating him for suicide or implanting some uh, thoughts on suicide in this patient can anybody respond okay so fine so um the thing is by uh, if we if we don't question patients about suicide if we don't talk about suicide openly then uh, the chances of finding the risk of suicide in the patient is very less unless you uh, identify the suicidal risk in a patient you can't help him so always you, you should be uh, brave enough and you should be uh, i see some i see some chat messages i'll take it later uh, yeah so you should always be uh, questioning uh, if you think that the patient has suicidal risk or if a patient uh, tells about his suicidal ideations uh, never be in doubt always uh, ask patient about suicidality there is nothing wrong in asking the patient about uh, or discussing about suicide with the patient okay so but uh, the patient should few patients will uh, will be yeah few patients will be very uh, very much in open they'll come to the psychiatric emergency setup saying that uh, we are having suicidal thoughts and that's why we came for help here and few patients will be uh, very introverts very shy they will not be opening up very easily so for that patients you have to give time you have to be patient you have to take uh, take them into confidence you have to establish a rapport be patient and let the patient uh, be patient and let the individual talk as much as he talks Uh, he might open up once uh, he establishes uh, once you establish a rapport with him once he is confident about you then only he'll open up and then only he'll talk about his suicide uh, once he talks about suicide you should assess his suicidal ideations does he have any plan if any plans he has uh, plans matlab it could be anything it could be hanging it could be consuming poison it could be taking the extra dose of medicines it could be anything so once he reveals uh, his plans you should identify what is the intent what is the motive behind that suicide uh, suicidal thoughts and what is the risk lethality so these things you have to assess so also you should also uh, identify the reasons and motivation for the attempt for a depressive patient uh hopelessness and worthlessness feelings and purposelessness feelings uh, these feelings are most commonly seen in suicidal uh, patients with uh, depression uh, when it comes to psychosis it could be commanding hallucinations it could be severe uh, severe uh, persecution those things could be a reason so you you always uh, try to identify the reasons and uh, motivation behind the attempt yes so uh, what do we do when we uh, encounter a patient who is having suicidal ideations so never take any uh, uh, threat of suicide uh, 
as a moderate risk always consider it as a high risk so i do agree that a few adolescents do uh, attempt self harm as a coping mechanism but still suicide risk is a risk so a threat of suicide is always a at a high risk so always try to hospitalize the patient and uh, there are there must be few uh, situations where you can't hosp hospitalize there are uh, no proper facilities or the patient uh, does not uh, uh, is not showing any interest or the family members also not showing any interest so such situations are very common to happen but when you see these uh, in this slide whatever you see here when these factors are present always try to convince the patient to hospitalize uh, so first is active psychopathology is present or not so find out whether there are any underlying mental illnesses it could be depression or psychosis or substance use or past history of suicide or family history of suicide try to find out if there are any risk factors or any active uh, psychopathology is present or not then try to assess his support family support so if a patient lives in a proper family setup then a uh, family can take care of him but if there is no support at all if a if a person is living in a hostel or he's living alone in a flat then automatically there is no one to take care of him so once in the night if uh, suicide uh, suicidal thoughts get worsen then uh, the chances of uh, uh, preventing the suicide or saving him becomes very difficult so as is the family support then comes accessibility to weapons or poisons so if uh, for example uh, we see in punjab the farmer, farmers having uh, uh, pesticides in their home so by easy accessibility i mean that so if there is an easy access to uh, poisons or lethal weapons at the home so it increases the risk so try to consider all these factors and based on that you uh, decide whether a patient requires hospitalization or not okay there are other factors like we have discussed uh, like past history of suicide whether it was a very lethal attempt in the past and the patient still thinks he doesn't deserve to live he regrets of living and he wants to die again if he has having active suicidal thoughts and those are the situations where we we should hospitalize the patient and then after uh, hospitalizing immediately what should we do we should uh, initiate the high risk suicidal management so these are the following steps that we should do in a high risk suicidal management most of you must be aware of this but uh, still i would uh, uh, present this slide like two to three attendants should be always in accompanying the patient and uh, eye ball to eye ball contact should be maintained with the patient and uh, and then all uh, sharp weapons lethal objects should be removed from uh, uh, from the uh, nearby the patient yeah sorry so uh, no medicines uh, should be uh, left to the patient uh, patient should not be left alone even to the toilet somebody should assist him and somebody, somebody should uh, monitor him uh, continuously and constant supervision by the staff uh, and the uh, preferably the bed should be yeah sorry for that yes and uh, and the doors of the room without latches or bolts from inside so these are the important things uh, what we do in a high risk uh, suicidal management and uh, moving on uh crisis intervention so three fourth of the people with self harm arrive at the hospital in the evening and patient should be admitted overnight at least so that uh, um, with a view to uh, psychosocial assessment would be proper uh, over the day and the suicidal thoughts also will decrease and there will be a, a, a relationship also established with the doctor and the patient so always uh, try to manage the crisis by hospitalizing the patient and no suicide contract by no suicide contract what i mean is uh, you sit and talk to the patient and establish and try to build up a contract with the patient be it written or verbal so few people are very religious so if they promise on the god promise on the family that they won't attempt suicide at least when the suicidal thoughts are at the peak uh, they'll think about their promises they'll think about their family and there is a chance that they might not attempt so there there's a chance i mean so that should be taken into account and uh, yes i do agree that uh, promises are meant to be broken so 
what we do with this uh, contractors, we are not just taking a promise from the patient. What we do is we are giving alternative options what he can do when the, his thoughts are at a peak. So you can give the contact numbers of NGOs, suicide helplines, or your personal contact number that he can contact at any point of time when he's having this uh, severe suicidal thoughts. So by engaging the patient by doing that, so when at that time of the, uh, at that point where the thoughts are at peak, where he has decided to attempt suicide, so these thoughts might also come in, uh, saying that there is a source for help. You can contact your family or a helpline or an NGO. Uh, so these thoughts might come into the patient and which will stop uh, the patient from attempting, which means that uh, I don't mean that a patient will not have suicidal ideas again, but at that point of time, that crucial thought will stop the patient from attempting suicide. So by this suicide contract, we mean to take a promise and also to provide an alternative approach what he can do at that time. So that is what I mean by no suicide contract. So we usually establish a contract with the patients in advance. So whoever uh, patient uh, comes to us having suicidal thoughts, we usually take a contract uh, saying that uh, not to attempt. And if he has suicidal thoughts, whom to contact and how, how can he contact? So all these things are made in this contract. So this is one option you can manage. And always, uh, like I said, in uh, uh, aggression and violence, suicide is also part of the other underlying psychopathology, like either depression or psychosis or for substance for that matter. So I believe that in the previous sessions, uh, our doctors have already discussed about management regarding depression, psychosis, etc. So always consider treating the underlying illness as one of the important steps and ECD can also be given for patients who are acute, uh, acutely suicidal. So moving on, uh, now delirium. So this is the third uh, topic of today's discussion. So uh, can any participants tell me whether uh, have you seen any patients of delirium? This is very common, especially in patients uh, who are in ICU, who had uh, a uh, recent stroke or a seizure for that matter, post seizure, we see patients in confusion. So that is a, a state of delirium, post ictal delirium we call. And delirium can be a part of anything. It could be organic, it could be psychiatric, most likely it is organic. So any of the participants would like to discuss their experience about their, uh, uh, about one, any of their patients having uh, delirium or seeing delirium in any of them. So everybody is silent, is that, I will take it as a no. Fine. I hope everybody is listening, they just uh, didn't keep their phones and... Okay, by delirium, uh, delirium is an acute confusional state. So the most common uh, symptoms what we see in delirium is, uh, it's a, delirium is an acute transient and reversible state of uh, confusion characterized by disorganized speech, thoughts and behaviors. There is disorientation, disorientation to time, place, and person, and there is inattention, uh, sleep disturbances, uh, sleep disturbance in the sense uh, uh, either sleep cycle in the night is disturbed or the patient will be sleeping more in the morning and not in the night. It could be anything. Sleep wake cycle is completely disturbed. And perceptual disturbances means hallucinations, delusions, picking behaviors, tactile hallucinations. These are the most common things what we see in delirium. So in delirium, um, uh, the in simple terminology delirium a patient is disoriented to time place and person and this disorientation is very transient it is not like completely 24 hours patient is disoriented so he might be disoriented at one point of time and the other point of time he might be completely oriented so this keeps on worsening especially in the nights you could see that patient is hallucinating more patient is more uh, uh, patient is getting aggressive more so this uh, delirium worsens mainly in the night so that is why this it is also called as sundowner syndrome. So once the sun goes down, this delirium goes up. That's why it is also called as sundowner syndrome. Where we usually see delirium patients is um, ICUs. So most of the patients who have uh, organicities uh, like metabolic disturbances, uh, uh, neurological conditions, infections. So in these patients, most commonly delirium is seen. Delirium is not uh, uh, exclusively for psychiatric, it is most commonly seen in organic conditions. So treating the cause uh, is the most uh, primary thing we have to do. Uh, most commonly it is metabolic disturbances. So treat the cause is the um, primary thing what we have to do in a delirium patient. 
any con any uh, delirium uh, is different from delirium tremens in delirium most commonly the reason is organic and in one second uh, sorry for the slide so uh, this uh, what do we do how do we treat uh, uh, delirium so usually what we prefer is we will give low dose antipsychotics always remember for delirium low dose antipsychotics is much more enough compared to severe aggressive patient so low dose antipsychotics uh, haloperidol can be given 0.5 mg or 1 mg for that matter when compared to uh, aggressive patient where we give uh, uh, 5 mg doses multiple times it could be 20 mg or 25 mg in a day also at times for few severe patients uh, but for aggression most commonly we will give up to 5 to 10 mg per day in delirium most commonly we will give for 1 to 5 mg per day so low dose antipsychotics you can give haloperidol risperidone olanzapine quetiapine so all these drugs can be given in low doses uh, for treating uh, delirium so by the giving this uh, low dose antipsychotics Uh, you can also combine with uh, benzodiazepines at times to give some sleep to the patient. So, by giving low dose antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, what we are doing is we are calming the patient, but we are not treating the underlying cause. This is only for behavioral uh, disturbances. What we are giving low dose antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, but delirium will be completely resolved only when you treat the underlying cause. So, if it is a CVA stroke, then you have to act accordingly. If it is a road traffic accident, head injury, you have to act accordingly, like that. Metabolic disturbances, hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia, infections, it could be anything. So, the cause should be treated. And along with that, to treat the behavioral disturbances and the sleep cycle disturbances, we use low dose antipsychotics and benzodiazepines. Okay. Any doubts regarding uh, delirium? Moving on, uh, delirium tremens. So it is also similar condition. Uh, I mean, symptoms wise, uh, it is uh, as similar as delirium. But here, coarse tremors are also seen. That's why delirium tremens. Most commonly, where we see this is in alcohol withdrawal. So once the patient, once the individual uh, who has been addicted to alcohol is taking alcohol in a daily pattern, suddenly stops alcohol. So two to three days later, uh, we see um, delirium tremens. Uh, patient being disoriented, having coarse tremors, few patients developing uh, hallucinations, uh, especially picking behavior, uh, tactile hallucinations, all these things. So these are very common in delirium tremens. So here the main uh, treatment would be giving benzodiazepines because in alcohol, what happens is uh, we are uh, supplying. Uh, I mean, we are taking alcohol. We are supplying the GABA receptors. So when alcohol is withdrawn, uh, the GABA receptors. We have by giving lorazepam, diazepam, we are acting directly on the GABA receptors. So we are substituting alcohol with benzodiazepines, which act on the GABA receptors. So if it is a condition of delirium tremens, which is because of alcohol withdrawal, the treatment of choice would be benzodiazepines, diazepam or lorazepam, preferably. And diazepam is a long-acting agent which we give in 10 mg doses, and uh, Lorazepam is a short-acting agent which we give in 2 mg doses. So usually a patient who is taking, uh, let's assume, one quarter of alcohol. One quarter of alcohol will make it six units per day and which requires at least 30 to 40 mg of diazepam and two to, uh, sorry, six to eight mg of lorazepam at least. So in that equations, you have to calculate and you have to uh, give uh, benzodiazepines accordingly. Okay, and withdrawal seizures is also very common. Uh, we see patients who have stopped taking alcohol immediately after a day. There is a high chances of developing seizures. So those are called withdrawal seizures. Here also, giving uh, lorazepam or diazepam and treating the cause. Like alcohol is the cause here, so treating the cause will be the uh, management process here. Any... Yes, moving on, catatonic patients. One second, I'll mute. Can you all please do? There's a lot of disturbance. Uh...
sorry next uh, moving on to catatonia from uh, delirium uh, so catatonia uh, there are multiple uh, signs and symptoms which can which we can see in a catatonic patient one second there are some i'll respond to the charts in the end of the presentation so uh, we can see uh, mutism stupor rigidity uh, posturing negativism and equally and ecopraxis these are the multiple signs and symptoms we've seen in a catatonic patient um, the Similarly, benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice. Usually, we prefer giving a lorazepam, which is also called lorazepam challenge test in this condition. So, if a patient responds to lorazepam, uh, we call him as a lorazepam responder. And over the next uh, three days to a week, we can give lorazepam. Uh, in most of the patients, uh, they improve within a week. And patients who are not responding well uh, to lorazepam can be given ECTs also. So, benzodiazepines and loraz uh, ECTs are the preferred uh, uh, management uh, which we give in catatonia and apart from that uh, catatonia could also be a secondary reason for underlying depression and psychosis which has to be treated accordingly with uh, antidepressants or antipsychotics Uh, acute dystonic reactions. Dystonias are one of the most common side effects of uh, antipsychotics. Uh, it's a sustained muscle contractions which will happen. It could be acute dystonias, extrapyramidal, extrapyramidal symptoms. So all these are very common when we are giving uh, antipsychotics. Uh, these are most common uh, when we give first generation antipsychotics like haloperidol. And uh, it is less common with second generation antipsychotics like uh, olanzapine, and risperidone, quetiapine, and all those things. So when a patient is on uh, antipsychotics, you should be actively looking for any possible side effects like uh, dystonias, EPS, uh, extrapyramidal symptoms, akathisias, etc. And neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It is one of the most uh, uh, critical conditions uh, which we see uh, in psychiatric emergency. So in psychiatric, uh, psychiatric patients who are on antipsychotics, suddenly they develop uh, uh, fever and uh, there's a uh, loss of consciousness also. Uh, mental state and autonomic dysfunction is very common in this neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So the preferred uh, treatment would be to stop all uh, causative agents. Supportive measures would be the, uh, like giving oxygen, hydration, and maintaining temperature would be the main uh, uh, resort for uh, uh, treating the patient. So pharmacological wise, uh, what is available in India is bromocryptin, uh, which uh, 2.5 to 10 mg per TTS can be given. And lithium toxicity. Patients who are on lithium can also develop to uh, toxicity. There's uh, more side effects of lithium. Uh, that's why we keep a serial monitoring of uh, lithium, which we do once in three months and six months. Uh, preferred level should be 0 0.6 to 1.2. Uh, more than 1.5, uh, patient can develop side effects. Uh, most common side effects what we see is uh, GA related, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, or uh, patients can develop uh, tremors, uh, headache, uh, severe uh, um, autonomic dysfunctions can also be seen. Once the levels are more than two, more than three, then the patient would require uh, hospitalization and few patients would require dialysis also in this case. So to manage is to stop uh, anti, uh, like lithium, psychotropics and adequate hydration and symptomatic management would be the treatment of choice in this case. And uh, so on the this is the last slide I'm going to discuss. So these are the most common medications what we use in psychiatric emergencies. First, haloperidol. So it comes, it can be given as oral medication or intramuscular and intravenous. Most common side effect is extrapyramidal symptoms. So uh, when we are giving uh, haloperidol, always keep a watch on uh, side effects like we have discussed dystonias, akathisias, or extrapyramidal symptoms. And then cardiac monitoring is also required in this case. And other medications, benzodiazepines or lorazepam and diazepam, which we commonly use in our psychiatry. So doses we have already discussed, like uh, 2 mg to 6 mg per day can be given lorazepam, depending upon the condition of the patient. If the patient requires more uh, sedation, uh, is very aggressive, uh, is unmanageable at all, then uh, lorazepam can be given in higher doses also. And diazepam also comes as uh, oral, intramuscular, and IV also given. Uh, in alcohol withdrawal cases, both lorazepam and diazepam are preferably given as intravenous uh, injections. And uh, initially, and once the patient is stable, then he can be put on oral medications. And for sedation purposes, preferably uh, when the patient is very aggressive, uh, 
preferably oral is preferred, but when the patient is very aggressive, if it is warranted, then intravenous injections also can be given. Uh, with benzodiazepines, respiratory depression is always a, a side effect, so have to monitor vitals. And phenylgan promethazine is, uh, has uh, anticholinergic side effects and cardiac monitoring is required. And olanzapine is one of, one of the drugs which are used recently intramuscular in very aggressive patients. So olanzapine, uh, like we discussed, extrapyramidal symptoms are very common and uh, those side effects should be monitored. Right. Uh, records maintaining all these things are uh, you must be aware of. So by here, uh, I'll end my presentation. So... Yes, if you have any questions, we can discuss. I'll try to respond to the chats also simultaneously. Yes. Uh, uh, any questions? Any topic to be discussed? Uh, please unmute, unmute yourself if you could. Uh, please unmute and we could, I can ask you a question so that everybody will be, uh, everybody can participate. So, uh, uh, Dr. Rajbir has asked, uh, is it also safe all these drugs in a postpartum psychosis female patient who is very much violent and agitated? Yes, sir. In a postpartum uh, female patient also, uh, pregnant patient also for that matter, who is very agitated, you have to uh, equate the risks and benefits. See, if a patient is pregnant, he's, she's carrying and she's getting very agitated and violent, there is a risk to harm uh, self or there is a risk to the baby also. So in those cases, you have to uh, give medications to that patient to calm her down. Preferably, antipsychotics like valanzapine and haloperidol are used in these cases. Um, and of course, yes, they have side effects. Every drug has its own side effects. Um, but you have to equate the risks and benefits. So uh, injections like olanzapine uh, or uh, haloperidol can be given both in injection form and or oral form. So there is no risk in giving that uh, compared to the risk if you don't give what will happen so that should be equated in pregnant uh, females if the patient is having mania or psychosis ect is also a treatment of choice so there are a lot of concerns about ect but it is uh, safe in pregnant women in uh, for that matter it is safe in any patient so uh, there is no problem in giving any of the drugs any of these drugs uh, to any patient and also in pregnant patients so uh, dr rashital jindal has raised her uh, question raised her hand yes ma'am yes ma'am oh yes 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 one second one second there's yeah yes ma'am you can ask your question now yes, uh, yeah hello um first of all i would like to say that this was very hurried presentation yeah Means, uh, <laughs> it was uh, not uh, that very you know uh, we I, at least I couldn't grasp that much. Okay. So it, it was not very useful for me. I'm not, uh, I can't say about the other people. Okay. But uh, it was a very hurried presentation. So like, for example, uh, we, uh, you have talked about safest approach, but you yeah. have not, uh, you know, discussed about it. We, if we do not know about it, then we, how can't we talk about it? You know, you have just skipped it off. Okay. So what is the use of that? <laughs> Okay. So the, these are uh, my points. I think we can take care in next presentations, if at least not sure, in this one. This, or you this can share will the be link. Available for, yeah, yeah. This, uh, yeah. this slide, these slides. So, will but how be can we discuss about it now? No, that is the, my point. Sure, so sure. I can't discuss anything right now. I have usually a lot many queries, but uh, this time I can't. Fine. We'll take care of that in the next presentation. Uh, anybody else? Anyone else has any queries? Any other questions? Any other uh, discussion points if you want to? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Uh, the, my question is regarding it is a practical situation that I just it happened yesterday only with me. 
The yes. thing is, if a patient who is uh, uh, a schizophrenic, because that man was he's schizophrenic, and he was very violent. He was he's been on treatment for last around uh, since two thousand six. Okay, ma'am. And for last two three days, he was very violent, and the patient, the relatives, they just came to me, and they were just asking, like uh, because initially he was damaging the property where they were staying. Okay. Then they called police, hmm. and the police people they refused to take him because he was a patient. Okay. And when they called uh, the hospital van, the uh, just to take that uh, uh, take that boy with them. So they just refused. They said, "Okay, because he is a violent patient, so they, he is going to harm us." And so that is a because it was an eye opening for me too, like how to handle this case because we are in Chandigarh. It was here in uh, you know we have best of the facilities here, but how to guide such persons? So yeah. this was a practical for me. I just want you to please the. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we also encounter a lot of uh, such situations. So there is a provision in the MHCA which clearly says that if a patient, uh, if a psychiatric patient, uh, requires help, so police should help. So there is a clear cut pro provision. So what happens in Bangalore? Most of the uh, we have a helpline in hands. So most of the people will call that helpline asking that, saying that some uh, patient is very aggressive. How to bring the patient? So uh, as a hospital policy, we can uh, we don't uh, go to the house and uh, take the patient. So that is that is our hospital policy. So what we do advise them is, uh, as part of the Indian uh, provision uh, laws. So there is MHCA which was released in 2017. There is provision that they can contact uh, the nearby police station. and the police should will guide them in bringing the uh, patient to the hospital so once the patient has reached the hospital then our uh, administration will take care of it so there is a provision man that we can be uh, that can be used and uh, a few private hospitals uh, they also have some rules like they have their own ambulances which can go uh, to the patient uh, uh, place and they can help them uh, in bringing the patient so that is that but as our hospital policy we don't have that so but we have a law which says that which says very clearly that police will should help them so that is happening in bangalore so that can be taken care of so, any other questions anyone Uh, Dr. Meghna, you are trying to ask something. Yes. Uh, yeah. So um, I actually had a patient who sent me a video of her father at 12 a.m. in the night. Uh, the patient is uh, is is schizophrenic and uh, uh, with a depression as well. so she sent me a, and and uh, the patient was having a, a psychotic acute violent agitated psychotic episode in the middle of the night and then she asked me ki uh, 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 she herself is an mbbs doctor yes, so she asked me what can be done for for this patient and uh, like at 12 in the night at at home can she administer something and so in such cases is it okay to uh, like just uh teleconsult and okay she was a doctor but what if 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 it is just a layman so um very uh, tricky situation because at uh, 12 am in the night of patient is very aggressive so what to do like uh, we can we could do uh, we could do the same thing we can take help of the police that is one option second option if you ask about tele if a patient is aggressive sitting in front of a desktop is not possible so that option is not there third option what we can do is we can uh, advise we can uh, uh, guide them to meet the nearby uh, psychiatrist so that is one option we can consider but it's a very tricky situation in the night uh, if at 12 o'clock if something like that happens so what else we can do is if a patient is taking some medicines if he agrees to take some medicines uh, because if a patient is already schizophrenic he'll be having some medicines or uh, he'll be uh, if we have a review over that uh, we can see what medicines can help if he agrees to take so otherwise there is only one option to uh, take care of uh, take uh, help of someone and bring the patient uh, to the hospital otherwise uh, uh, we don't know what what exactly has triggered because if a patient has been in uh, has been receiving treatment for so long and suddenly he has become violent 
there are chances that it could be something else and not just schizophrenia. So it could be a risky also in that way. Uh, so we have to evaluate and then if we go ahead, that would be a good situation, good choice, I, I would feel. Uh, hello, sir. Again, if uh, like we are, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, Doctor Meghna. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, uh, is it a good idea to just uh, prescribe them some uh, syrup, serenades, or something like that, so that they can take it orally, or it would be still a tricky situation because we are not able to really evaluate them? Yeah. Uh, in this case, uh, at least we ha we have the help of a doctor. So. Yeah. So in this case, we have the help of a doctor. So we can tell her some basic things like to check her orientation or check his vitals. So that could be of help in this case. So that can be done. But uh, I would still suggest if it is possible to take him to a psychiatrist or a nearby hospital and evaluate properly and then to go ahead. Okay. It, it, it's not okay if we just prescribe like syrup, uh, haloperidol or something that they can get from a pharmacy and give it to the patient meanwhile just to uh, so that they they become a little calm and then uh, they can then take to a psychiatrist or something would that be advisable or not uh, officially no officially no so yeah uh, dr sheetal you were asking something yeah we are dealing with the oat clinic patients uh, are you able to hear me yes ma'am yes ma'am go ahead we are dealing with oat clinic patients, so they usually get aggressive. You know, opioid so, opioid clinic you are saying, ma'am. Yes, opioid clinic patients. Yes, so they usually get aggressive. In fact, we are getting new uh, innumerable patients, like sometimes up to five hundred patients in a day. Mm -hmm. So they come early in uh, morning all together. So it happens obviously because of, uh, as you were just mentioning in your one of the slides that uh, uh, staff is not sufficient or inexperienced staff is there on, at some times. Certain times some security guards are not that, way, that very, you know, newer staff is there. So mm -hmm. what happens is they just sit outside our clinics that mm -hmm. we will not allow anyone to take the medicine, that the yeah. type of a thing. Yeah. So they will just sit out there. So uh, these are situations, okay, fine. We will call, I usually call as situ police, I'll call. Yeah. They will come, the hand, but the time is, much of the time is wasted in this thing. Obviously yeah. we'll have to respond, um, give the thing to us authorities and all, you know. So, so one day it happened that two hours were wasted in all this. So mm -hmm. there is there is a six hours time with our clinic and two hours are wasted. So what, what should we do? Because you are so legal, it has happened, ma'am. Anu can also medical, I'm working as a MO in charge of Pakta district Batinda presently. I was previously working as yeah, previously I was working as medical officer in charge of district hospital. I was, uh, I was, I finished my MD from PJ Chandigarh. So we also used to face a similar uh, problems because there are opioids and so both PJ lumber line. So like, we are getting the guidelines actually, yes, in fact, for this. Both lumber line lag hai wahan. So yeah. these situations are very common there. So administrative help we can do, but uh, medically, uh, I think from my end. No, what but this is what I'm asking you, know, like this is kind of practical situation. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example, when I was in district hospital, we used mm -hmm. to have around 700 to 1000 patients in a day. Mm -hmm. It was a kind of a condition was there. So, uh, but what, what is like practically what should we do in that kind of a situation? Like there are so many patients who are actually needing the medical help at that time. They will even, if they're standing in the line for so long, they can develop some med medical emergency at that time, even if they were not bringing it from home. So this is also a condition which if you can, can we guide us uh, in some later um, presentation? Sure, along sure. With some later. sure. I'll have a word with my team. We also have run an opioid clinic, clinic here. Yeah. So we'll see uh, how our, our administration is dealing with it. So we see because these, the... because these situations are really, uh, you know, harming us, uh, hampering our work throughout the month or throughout the year. So sure. this requires some. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, anyone else? 
Okay, if there are no other questions, can we wind up? I'll see the chat box. Uh, yeah, okay. So there are no other, no other questions in the chat box also. So thanks. Thank you all for uh, joining.